This is Chris Kelly with our next recording on the joint by joint approach to training. All right, and this, this recording is going to come after our movement screening presentation because this kind of puts the pieces together. All right, we talked about movement screening and kind of looking at larger patterns. And you're probably thinking to yourself, you know, when I when I screen somebody, you know, and 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 I see these things wrong, like you know, the person can't get their heels down to their butt in the squat, or you know, somebody's knees buckle in, um, you know, when when they're doing this, like why does this happen, you know? And, and really, it's overwhelming in the beginning because like, what do I do about it? You know, th there's a lot of um, there's a lot of I think mysticism surrounding corrective exercise, and really, um, what I love about the idea of the joint by joint is it gives us sort of a, a schematic to look at the body in a simple way, you know, and, and then start to make common sense and um, I guess uh, changes um, that make sense for the client and that are tangible in nature. So the joint by joint approach to training is a, a the idea that basically the body is a stack of joints. Certain joints are built for more mobility. Certain joints are built for more stability. All right. Certain joints um, are need motion. Okay. Need more mobility and certain joints are going to need more stabilizing. Okay. Like with core training, for example, the lumbar spine is what we consider a stable joint. Okay. So if I'm doing a lot of crunches, a lot of rotation, a lot of like rushing twists, that kind of thing, I'm actually mobilizing that segment. I'm teaching that segment to move more when in daily life from a functional perspective, its job is to stabilize and to prevent excess motion. Okay. And so this kind of gives us an idea of, you know, whereas the hips, the joint immediately below um, the lumbar spine are going to be a mobile joint. So we want to do hip mobilizations. You know, we want to do, you know, things like, um, you know, squat to stands and um, Spider-Mans and things that if you've worked with me for a while, you're familiar with. If you're not, you will be by the end of this presentation. But the point is we want to drive mobility to one joint and then to the, the joint above, you know, we want to drive stability. Okay. And what often happens is when we lose stability in a, or when we lose mobility in a certain joint like the hips, we start to gain it somewhere else. Okay. So if I lose, um, let's say I, you know, I sit in a chair a lot, so I lose the ability to fully extend or flex my hip. Um, I, I have to gain that somewhere because my body is smart and it's going to get there somehow. So I start to move from my back more. Okay. And over time, because I start to move from my back more, um, my back starts to hurt because it's not built as well for that job. Okay. So this starts to give us an idea of, okay, if I don't move from one place, another place is going to move. Okay. Because that's kind of how the body works. And we'll dig more into this, um, as we get into our joint by joint. So really the, one of the biggest things um, with this as well is, you know, consider who you're working with. Um, when I started as a trainer over 10 years ago now, um, people were in much better shape. Okay. They stood up taller. Um, they moved better. And, um, you know, as of 2015, when this presentation is being recorded, um, you know, what is the big difference between now and 10 years ago? Um, for me, it's the introduction of the iPhone. Okay. Now, um, you know, the advancement of computers as well, but now we text much more. Um, we sit much more, you know, we, we, we're hunched over our phones much more. You know, I see this in my young athletes and I see this for a lot of people that we work with. And so this, this inevitable posture decay that, um, you know, is supposed to occur during, over a lifetime. Time, you know, where we see this individual on the right here that's literally sort of locked into a C curve happens much earlier. Okay. And, you know, as a result, we start to get issues that we see a lot, you know, traditionally we see in later life, like, um, you know, osteoarthritis, um, you know, tendonitis, things like that occurring at a much, much younger age. And so one thing I tell my clients is we choose the way that we age every day. And, and really, you know, even as a 90 year old, there's absolutely no reason if we've taken care of ourselves throughout our lifetimes that we can't do things like, um, you know, run, but we can't do things like lift heavy weights. I'm, I'm not saying that it's typical of a 90 year old to, you know, go run a 5k or something, but it is possible if we do maintenance to ourselves. And I think that's everybody right as far as how we take care of ourselves and for us as trainers you know our goal is not to become a physical therapist or to um, you know do manual therapy of any kind on anybody or, or step over our scope of practice however I think it is our duty to make people aware of challenges they face and give them simple tools to empower them you know to take care of themselves and, and view this as as integral a part of the training process as strength as conditioning or as anything else that we deal with so really, before we get into the joint by joint, let's talk about how injury occurs, okay, and how this influences what we're talking about. So we have the idea of a cumulative injury uh, cycle where we we incur some kind of a tissue trauma, okay. So let's say I tweak my left tip when I'm running, okay. Inflammation is going to form that area as a result, okay, because that's the body's uh, pain response, all right. That's called nociception oftentimes. So my muscles start, start to spasm. 
And over time, as the healing process occurs, I start to get scar tissue in that area and adhesions start to form. Another thing happens, though, is that, you know, from a neurological perspective, my body wants to shift me away from that injury to take a little bit of pressure off that area and let it heal. So maybe I shift my way to the right, okay? And, you know, if I do nothing about, uh, you know, so I, I continue with that pattern, okay? And if I don't um, do anything about it in terms of reshifting my stance or retraining that as, you know, my body does heal, that weight shift becomes my new normal. Okay, so maybe I walk more with, um, you know, if I had a left sided injury, maybe I'm walking more now to my right with, you know, uh, more weight shifted onto my right side. Over time, I start to incur more injuries on my right side because now more weight is, is positioned there. Okay, and really consider all of the old injuries that have occurred to you over your lifetime. Maybe you broke an arm when you were seven, or, you know, maybe somebody sprained their ankle in high school. You know, it's 30 years later, but this accounts for a lot of the movement based things that we see, you know, pain that occurs, you know, other issues that occur that might not seem directly related to the problem. But the point being is that um, this, this cycle of injury is the reason trigger points form. It's, it's the reason that we incur a lot of non-contact injuries. And it's the reason why, you know, we see a lot of the things that we see in our movement screen. And really, it's Davis's law in stating that soft tissue molds along the lines of stress. So really, anything that we do um, is going to create more muscle tone um, in those areas. You know, and it's also going to, you know, if we repetitively position ourselves in a certain way, predispose us to more um, pain, wear and tear on that side. So, you know, prolonged sitting or standing. I mean, if I if I sit all day with my hip flexed, you know, it makes sense that I'm not going to have as much hip extension. Um, you know, if I turn around to my left side to maybe look back at a computer or something all day, you know, then maybe I'm developing, you know, left sided aches and pains because I'm rotating in that direction. Um, if I work my pecs a lot, you know, I'm going to get real stiff in that area. So really all of these things are, cho are choices that we make. And so, you know, oftentimes they say the best training often is going to be doing the opposite of the repetitive patterns that we're in. So really when you're looking at somebody, consider um, what their lifestyle looks like and what repetitive positions that they adopt throughout the day. So let's get back to this idea of the joint by joint theory of training. The idea is that the body is essentially a stack of joints. Okay, certain joints are going to be built for more mobility, while certain joints are going to be built for more stability. Okay, pain in a particular area of the body is oftentimes going to be due to loss of function, either above or below that particular area. Okay, so let's take somebody that has knee pain. Okay, okay. If you look at the knee, the knee is what we consider to be a stable joint. Okay, certainly the knee flexes and extends, it rotates to a lesser degree, but it's not as well built to do that job as the hip or the ankle. Okay, and so if we lose um, motion at my ankle, oftentimes that force is going to, well, always that force is going to have to be um, diverted somewhere else. So I get more impact um, in my knee and, you know, in my hip in that case. So, you know, if we lose mobility in both the hip and the ankle, you know, it's kind of like uh, squeezing two ends of a garden hose, you know, pressure is going to build up in the middle. My knee is going to have to move a lot more to do that job. And therefore, you know, a lot more stress creates a lot more wear and tear, create oftentimes going to create pain. You, you know, the low back is another stable joint. Um, whereas it's, um, above and below we have the hip and the thoracic spine okay so if we lose motion to either of those joints something similar happens okay so if, let's say i sit all day so i can't flex in my hip okay so then i start to extend from my low back um start to ex start to develop extension based back pain okay so the the motion of extension you know where i stand up and i try to extend fully you know i start to extend more from my back and so my back starts to get pain okay and again you know it might sound complex but you know anytime that you're dealing with pain in any segment just consider like what are the muscles around it doing you know do i have full mobility in the joint above full mobility in the joint below you know and and then that helps us to start to divert some interventions you know in that direction and so when we look at the whole body, um, it's it's pretty simple, and that's what I love about it. Is again, this is a, an oversimplification of how the body works, but it's great because it's it it creates a pretty good understanding. So. The foot, when we look at the foot, we want the foot to be pretty stable as well as mobile. But we're going to consider it a stable joint because we have a lot of people that deal with pronation. Okay, when I'm not able to form an arch with my foot, you know, and I'm not able to kind of create the arch to push off as I'm moving, you know, I, I call that uh, walking on a flat tire because, again, your foot just collapses in, you know, and therefore we start to get, um, you know, a lot more motion or a lot more um, stress at the ankle, at the knee, you know, the segments above. Whereas the ankle is a mobile joint, okay? We all wear positive 
positive sold shoes, so we're all shifted forward onto our toes a lot. As, as a result, we lose the ability to dorsiflex or to sit back on our heel. Okay, And when we don't have the ability to do that, uh, my ankle isn't acting as a shock absorber like it should anymore. So we want our, um, you know, we want our heel or our ankle to be a mobile spring. So when we step down, it has enough, enough motion to absorb that stress and then, you know, utilize, work with the foot to push off. When that doesn't happen, you know, again, I start to get some mo some of that motion or some of that stress diverted uh, to the knee and again, up the chain. Um, the knee is a, sta a stable segment. Again, we want the knee to remain over the hip and over the ankle to kind of like transfer force as we walk. All right. Again, it's going to do some movement, but we, we really want the system, you know, the, the, the ankle, the knee, the hip to work together uh, synergistically to, to create that movement and to distribute stress evenly. Whereas oftentimes if I don't have that in the joint above or below, you know, the, the knee is going to take a beating there. Okay. The hip is a mobile joint. The hip is what is called uh, considered a ball and socket joint. It moves you know, more than almost any other joint in the body. As a result, you know, we, we can flex, we can extend, we can rotate from that area and we want to drive that motion there. So when we're doing uh, mobility exercises, uh, the, the hip and the pelvis are an absolute priority as far as optimizing joint mobility there. Uh, whereas the um, the lumbar spine, okay, our lower back is a stable joint, okay, um, and the spine itself is, you know, a, a huge structure, but that particular area you know, certainly does have some flexion, extension motion to it, uh, less, less or so with rotation. But again, um, the reason that we do things like planks, side planks, um, you know, dead bugs, things like that, is to train the abs to stabilize that spot and, and hold that in place, you know, as opposed to doing a lot of like twisting motions and flexion extension exercises where, you know, I'm doing crunches and leg lifts. The thoracic spine, so the middle part of the back, is a mobile joint. All right? The thoracic spine has a much, much greater capacity uh, to rotate versus the lumbar spine. And, and with this, when we're throwing or we're, we're rotating in any way, we want to think about rotating from our hips and our upper back versus getting motion from our lower back. Okay, and So this is kind of like the idea of, you know, we want our mobile segments to do the, the sort of the, to drive the motion, you know, as we're throwing, as we're catching, as we're moving our arms. The scapula, okay, which is on the back side, you can't really see it quite as well as the stable joint. Okay, and the scapula is the one example of a joint that's not fixed to the body um, by bone. Okay, and so the scapula is sort of the wing bone um, in our upper back, and those wing bones, um, the muscles that influence those things, help our arms to glide overhead. And so we have dominance of you know one of those muscles back there. Let's say the upper traps, where I shrug my shoulders every time I move my arms or my head. You know, we, we get some poor motion in that area and we start to get you know, things like shoulder dysfunction and that kind of thing. You know, in our last area that we're going to look at um, would be the shoulder. And the shoulder is a mobile joint. All right. The shoulder is another ball and socket joint. The shoulder moves, has the most motion of any joint in the body. OK. And so we want to make sure that we have optimal, you know, internal external rotation, flesh and extension of the shoulder um, to be able to move well. And so when we look at the example of potential injury, and this, the idea behind all of this is sort of the idea of the kinetic chain. Okay, and the kinetic chain is just the, um, the chain of muscles and joints that adjoin our body up and down. Okay, so the joint by joint, um, and the, how the joint by joint is going to be influenced by muscles. Okay, and so let's look at the example of maybe a foot that doesn't do a very good job of creating an arch. All right, I get a pronation at my... Uh, foot there, it creates an internal rotation or valgus force on my uh, femur as well as my tib and fib. And what ends up happening is I get the a potential injury mechanism. All right, one exercise, one uh, issue that we deal with a lot are ACL tears. Right, and oftentimes the one of the main um, contributors to that motion or to that injury would be um, internal rotation and flexion. Okay, and so you can see that like if I go to cut. Um, with that leg like that, if I don't have active control and I'm fatigued, you know, then oftentimes, you know, my muscles are not going to do their job and we're going to get uh, ripping and tearing in that area. So when you're screening somebody and you see them squat, you see, you know, the knees come in and we see this position. Um, that's why I say, you know, we can oftentimes spot injuries before they occur. You know, that's not 100 percent always. But when we're dealing with somebody that is you know, regularly exerting themselves at a pretty high level, you know, this is very helpful. Okay. And so again, you can kind of see some other examples here. Um, you know, it, it, 
the, the that could create an apparent leg length discrepancy. You know, it could tilt the pelvis. I mean, we have all these other things that happen. But for us, we're looking at you know what is the where where does the breakdown occur? You know, what segments are not doing their job? You know, in this case, you can kind of see that it starts from the foot. So one question I'm always asking myself is like, what segment is not doing its job, and really, what is the one segment we want to look at most? And so again, when we're looking at um, when we're looking at potential injury here, we have, you know, pronation with internal rotation of the knee. Okay, so that's ACL tear. Okay, whereas, you know, we could have people who have tightness in their hip um, rotators where they're getting a varus force, which is the opposite, so supination. So I'm a good example of that. I shift my weight to the outside of my feet, so my, the, my IT bands and my, um, you know, my hip rotator muscles, they're always tight because they're on all the time. Okay, so it's how we shift our weight, you know, whereas what we want is sort of this idea of subtalar neutral um, where everything lines up together okay and it's kind of the idea of like a car you know like if a car if a car's wheels are in alignment you know it's going to do pretty well over 10,000 miles but if, if one of the wheels is slightly out of alignment you know we start to get um you know pressure building up we start to get you know um we start to get some you know poor some the misalignment creates micro traumas tears things like that and eventually you know it, it's going to create some damage to the car and and our bodies are kind of the same way and again we don't want there's no absolutely no way that you know we're going to get somebody moving perfectly and that's not the idea but we can look at how they move to understand um, maybe what we don't do um, to contribute to this and some smart modifications we can make to their training um, to help with that Okay, and so to put this all together, um, compensations occur due to poor posture and repetitive stress in a certain area. And over time, uh, movement and inefficient movement causes micro traumas to build in that particular area. And so I kind of liken it to bending a credit card in the middle. Okay, I can bend a credit card in the middle, you know, 10 times, really nothing's going to happen. Okay, I can bend it in, in the middle 100 times, and I'm going to start to see probably a divot in the middle. But, you know, it's still okay. But I can bend it a thousand times in the middle. And maybe like on rep 1003, um, it snaps. Okay. And that's kind of the idea is that um, trauma builds up. Okay. It doesn't just go away. Um, over time, it will go away if we correct the movement. But if, if we keep moving poorly and we keep tweaking this thing over and over and over with no break, um, especially when we start to incorporate fatigue and other things into it, then eventually, you know, stuff happens. And so that's how somebody can throw their back out you know, bending over a thousand times. It's not that they had a bad back. It's that their back was actually probably too strong. You know, it just, it just couldn't put up with that crap anymore. So, you know, again, we just, that, and, and that's also why trigger points and adhesions form in a certain area over time due to repetitive stress. You know, we can, we can foam roll and we can do whatever we want to work on those things, but if we don't train the movement and, and improve the pattern itself, then those things are just going to come back. The other thing that I'm asking myself, you know, when I'm screening somebody, you know, taking the joint by joint into account is what segment needs WD-40 and what segment needs duct tape. Okay, so WD-40, you know, we're applying a mobility strategy to an area. Okay, so let's say the hips are really tight. Okay, the hips need WD-40. Okay, so we use a mobility drill or we use foam rolling to influence the joint to move better. Whereas you know, let's say the knees um, are moving too much, right? With those, we want to actually use a strategy to decrease the motion, all right? So to teach the body to move better from other places. So in that case, you know, WD-40 or a stability-based strategy is what we're going to utilize. And so, again, it's just the idea of within, you know, in engineering, that's the idea is, you know, does the area move? Um, should it move? You know, if it, if it should, then we use WD-40. If it shouldn't move, um, then we use duct tape. So if we put all this together and we're looking at our various joints, all right, th this can be confusing. And when I first learned this concept, um, you know, certainly I had a lot of questions, but this is my attempt to simplify things, okay? And so the way I want you to start thinking is, what joints are going to be need to need to be mobilized, need to be stabilized? Okay, so let's take a client that has knee pain. Okay, we know that the the knee is a stable joint. Okay, so the knee is going to need duct tape. Okay, so what does that mean? We want to look at the um, the joint above and below. Okay, so we look at um, or the adjoining joint. So we look at the foot. Okay, the foot is another area that's going to need stability. So starting there, can the person balance well? Okay, do they form an arch? Okay, if we if they don't then those are two exercises 
there are two things that we want to prioritize. Just take some uh, of potential causes off the table. Moving up, we want to look at the ankle. Okay, we know that the ankle is going to need WD-40 or it's going to need some more motion. Okay, so does the person have optimal dorsiflexion, meaning when they squat down, when they do an overhead squat, can they get all the way down? If not, then that's also something that we can increase to help to optimize or take pressure off of the knee. Okay, looking up at the hip, all right, does the hip move well? Okay, so when the person is doing a single leg stance um, test, does the knee collapse in as they do a single leg squat? Okay, if it does, then doing things like glute bridges and band walks to help to teach the hip muscles to control the knee better, again, is going to take further pressure off the knee. And so you can kind of see how, you know, these different things are going to play in together. Moving up, if we're looking at back pain, okay, which would occur at our next stable joint, the lumbar spine, we know that the lumbar spine, you know, we're going to need duct tape, but let's begin with the hip. All right, does the hip move well in both flexion, extension, as well as rotation? Okay, in an overhead squat, can the person get down all the way? All right, can they get down all the way in a, um, what does their glute bridge look like? Do they start to cramp up almost immediately? Um, or are they, are they able to hold with their plank? Is their plank, um, does their plank work well? Or are they feeling it in their low back as they do so? Okay, and so for us, we kind of look at the direction of motions that are limited. Okay, so let's say they can't fully extend from their hip. Then we're going to want to do things like a half kneeling hip extension that teaches the hip to fully extend. Okay, whereas, you know, with if the person can't move side to side very well, um, we're going to look at something like a Spider-Man that teaches the person to improve, you know, rotation of their hip. And I say, you know what, when in doubt, do all of them together. You know, do a motion that involves forward motion of the hips and then something that involves side to side motion of the hips. Okay, and then you're teaching the client to do things like planks, side planks, um, glute bridges. So the muscles around their um, spine are stabilizing properly. Okay, and then you kind of look at that. So again, when the hips move well, we take a lot of pressure off of the low back and it's not forced to do as much. And then when we tighten up, you know, the muscles or we stabilize the muscles that's, that involve how it moves, you know, again, then we're going to uh, develop a better stability strategy for that area. And finally, you know, let's look at general neck pain. Okay, oftentimes pain is going to occur in the neck of the shoulder, but the first thing to look at is the thoracic spine. Okay, for the thoracic spine, we need WD-40. Um, we want our thoracic spine to move as well as possible. So we're using things like the peanut on that area. We're rolling the person's pecs, their lats, the, the, the muscles that are good, the big muscles that are going to influence the, the way that the thoracic spine moves. Okay. We're also going to do things like um, floor slides, um, sideline reach and rotates to help the thoracic spine to extend and to rotate as well as it possibly can. You know, from there, we're going to look at the scapula. Does the person, as they move their arms over their head, does it actually move well, or are they getting, like, clicking and popping, you know, in their shoulders they move up? But if they're not, you know, an exercise like a forward-facing wall slide where we're working on the client's ability to get their arm up and down while making those muscles, making, you know, the low traps participate with the upper traps um, is a good fit for that person. And finally, you know, we're looking at the shoulder, okay? Is the shoulder uh, moving well, or does the person... Um, or does the person's arm, you know, when they can the person raise their arms over their head or or not, you know, and if not, you know, we use some mobility drills to to improve that. Uh, and really, you know, as a, as a takeaway from this, again, I'm just always thinking what joints are restricted and what joints are, are doing their job or not. Um, and as it applies to the movement screen, you know, we can retest after we've done some of these foam rolling and and. Uh, you know, uh, self mobility strategies, and you'll see immediate improvement. And that's kind of what we want. You know, and this is not something to get so far down the road with that we're working only thinking about corrective exercise, but it starts to give us a better idea of how segments of the body moves, and so we can prove global movement with everything. And so what's the first step for us as trainers? Like, what are the tools that we have in our toolbox to help the client move better? And step one is going to be self myofascial release, okay, or foam rolling, okay? And this is something that's been around for a while, but the, if your clients are not doing this right now, I mean, I, they, sh they absolutely should. If you get no other takeaway from this, I hope that you have, you, you know, I hope that you can take away that this is a game changer as far as the way that your clients move, all right? And it's really, it's just... The way I explain it, clients, it's self-massage to release muscle muscle tightness. You know, I say tightness. We, we it really what it is, it's guarding. Um, and you know, sometimes our muscles are going to get tight just due to the nervous system locking those things down. So if we look at um, the tool, the different tools that we can apply um, to foam rolling, you know, we have things like 
the traditional foam roller. Okay, so this is a the you know a white or a black tube, and you've probably seen these in you know gyms and PT clinics or wherever, wherever you've been. We use these to work on larger global muscles, whereas we have smaller implements like a lacrosse ball to get into more trigger points and smaller areas. All right. The peanut are two tennis balls that are taped together, and that's a thoracic mobilizer, right? That's an absolute game changer as far as working on your upper back. And then the PVC pipe to get into areas like, um, you know, uh, the foot, the calf, or then to fight off attackers or clients that don't pay their bills. Just kidding. So one of the big challenges with foam rolling is explaining why it works to our clients. And, and really, just keeping it simple, really all foam rolling is doing is we're creating compression over a muscle to tell it to relax and release. Okay, Oftentimes, our muscles get tight due to the fact that our body locks down that area for stability reasons. You, know, you don't have to tell the client that, but you can say things like it corrects muscle imbalances, it increases guarding of the nervous system, it decreases soreness, and it does all of those things. But the main thing is... It's a poor man's massage. Um, it helps our muscles to relax and to release tension. So when we talk about rolling specifically, we talk about two types of rolling. Um, a, I, I call our first type of rolling our pre-workout roll. Okay, because really what that is, uh, we're rolling 10 to 15 times slowly over an area. Okay, and the goal is to compress that muscle at a very controlled pace. All right, and all that means is that we're pressing down into the area. We're creating compression um, to help to tell that muscle to relax or to release. All right, whereas with corrective or trigger point work, then I'm taking uh, you know maybe a smaller imp imp implement like a tennis ball or a lacrosse ball, and I'm getting into a sore or a tender area okay and so I'm tacking over that area and I'm moving my arms up and down or I'm, I'm doing some extremity motion and I'm trying to break up that scar tissue a little bit all right both of those things have value but I think we, we definitely use the pre-workout role more because we're doing it uh, before every workout it, the other thing is that with rolling you know, and if I have any LMTs taking this course, you know, you know this, the right type of pressure is absolutely essential. Rolling is a stress like anything else. And I've had clients before that have rolled an area and liked it so much that they've taken a ball home, rolled for 45 minutes and come back with a butt cheek that's black and blue the next day. Okay, not necessarily the most pleasant thing to look at. And the point is that, you know, it, it's, it's creating an internal stressor to the muscles um, like anything else, all right? When we strength train and we do stuff on the outside, we're creating a, or when we strength train, we do the same thing. We create an internal stress to our muscles. And so from rolling, you know, it's, it's a similar process, okay? And that's not to say that you can go roll and create, you know, a lot of muscle tone by doing that, but we definitely want to we, we want to uh, pick the right tool for the right job and only do it for the minimal amount of time necessary to get what we need. Okay, and so I always start people on a white roller. Okay, and the reason that is is because a white roller is almost the consistency of like a pool noodle. All right, it feels soft, it feels good. Somebody's going to do that, and they're going to be like, oh yeah, it feels like a you know a light massage. And usually the lightest pressure possible is what we want because it's going to tell the muscle to relax into it. And that's what that's always what I tell my clients to do is try to relax into the roller. If it's too hard, um, then they're just going to tighten up, you know. And we're actually going to get the opposite effect of what we want. So you know, then we have the black roller, which is pretty standard you know in most gyms that I see uh, this is going to be a much much harder so again you know if you have the option of a white roller if somebody's dealing with a lot of stuff so, uh, particularly somebody that's in chronic pain you know, start them there from there we have things like the rumble roller okay that, which are actually reinforced with PVC pipe and then the lacrosse ball so again it's just picking the right tool for the right job and you know over time as the person kind of desensitizes to the roller which is going to happen if they're doing it uh, you know a lot then we can move them to a harder implement um, I have athletes who actually roll with PVC pipes at this point, but it's not a typical thing. And so I'm not saying to you know do that with everybody by any means. So start light and then increase the pressure as we go along. So when we look at our upper body foam rolling routine, um, you know these are kind of the spots that we're usually going to hit. All right, and I, I always say with rolling, we want to proximize proximal mobility before distal mobility. And what that means is that I'm going to look at the biggest muscles that influence my proximal structures. All right, and the, my lats would be number one. Okay, you can see me rolling my big armpit muscles here on the side or on the uh, on the top left hand corner here. The lats are uh, the biggest muscles in the upper body, and they're really going to influence the rest of the thoracic spine. So we we want to start with those, all right? Then the next one would be the thoracic spine. So, you know, I'm using my peanut 
Um, and I'm really working on that, that those segments to get those segments unstuck. You know, our, our, our probably our third priority would be the upper traps uh, because again they're going to influence the neck. But you notice that all of those structures are pretty big muscles. You know, then we can start getting into areas like our rotator cuff, our pec minor, things like that. But if you only have you know three to five minutes to roll, prioritize your bigger muscles. Um, prioritize the things that are going to influence our uh, the thoracic spine more. You know, and then as you have time, start to move outward and work on things surrounding the shoulder, you know, and that sort of thing. You know, for the for the lower body, um, you know, again, it's the same idea. We want to we want to start um, with the muscles that are going to most um, influence the pelvis. So my quads, my you know, my my hip rotators, uh, my calves are priorities. All right, and the reason that is is because they have a direct effect. Um, probably more than most other things on uh, the position of my knee, the position of my hip, my um, inner thighs are another one. So again, there are a lot of potential areas that you could roll, but these are the areas that we have our clients roll daily uh, because we see really the most bang for the buck as far as how they influence the position of the body. So step two is going to be active mobility. Okay, so now we've rolled, we've gotten a little bit more mobility. The next step then would be to move through newly acquired ranges of motion. Okay, and if you're warming up for an athletic activity, you know, you would call this a dynamic warm up. Okay, if you're talking about more corrective exercise, you know, that's still dynamic mobility. We're just moving it for the purpose, or we're just doing it for the purpose of increasing range of motion. All right, so with that, it's the difference between doing something like, say, a chest stretch where I'm just holding my arm up and stretching my chest to moving my arm up and down in the same position, which I might do with a wall slide. All right, the the, the one difference is that it's much more, um, it's much faster. You know, the wall slide gets over faster. And you know, the other thing is that I'm taking my, I'm training my nervous system as well. Okay, so I'm teaching my body to get my arm up and down and utilize and improve useful range of motion. All right, that's absolutely key. That's why we don't just stretch to warm up. Is because if I'm stretching, I'm sending a signal to my body that, um, you know, a we're cooling down, but b also I'm just going to hold in this position. Whereas that's not what we do in daily life. We actually move through range of motion. So in order to actually use those ranges of motion in training, you know, and load them and add weight to them and things of that nature, I want to start them with a lower load task where I'm actually kind of mimicking that motion. So if we look at our mobile areas, our first uh, mobile area is the ankle. All right? The ankle is um, an area that requires dorsiflexion. Okay, So my ability to sit back on my heels, uh, to bring my knee out over my toe. So what we're doing there is we're intentionally, you can see kind of the two positions at the bottom, I'm intentionally driving my knee out over my toe, or the, the person demonstrating is, to challenge dorsiflexion. Okay, Another one is uh, a person in a um, push-up position there. They're doing a traditional downward dog where they're rocking their um, butt up in the air, they're pressing their heels into the ground. Both of those are um, challenging ankle dorsiflexion. And, and really with mobility drills, we want to move at a slow and controlled pace and then just try to rock into greater ranges of motion uh, with each uh, with each rep. And so again, some mobility drills. The other thing is that with um, you know our, our the idea of dorsiflexion, we want to look at substitutes. Okay, so what are some subs? That we can make for somebody that might not be able to get down all the way in an overhead squat. Okay, one, you know, we could put their heels up on a board. Okay, and this is a good way to, um, you know, to get around that problem. Um, I'm not a personally a fan of this just because it's going to increase pressure on the knees, but it's a way to go. You know, if you're teaching your, your client to squat body weight, you want to get them into that, that greater range of motion. You know, that's certainly an option. You know, what I'd like to do is, you know, start them with a maybe a higher, uh, a couple mats that are stacked on top of one another. And then as they get better, you know, we remove those mats, um, you know, until they can squat all the way parallel without the use of that. You know, the other, the other thing, which I like a little bit better is a box squat. Okay, the reason that is is when I when I'm doing a box squat, you know, that's somebody sitting back onto a box, and what I'm what I'm trying to do there is teach the mer the person to move more from their hip versus their ankle. Okay, and so you see people that squat and their ankles, their knee comes way out over their toe. You know, maybe they get down all the way because they do have a lot of ankle mobility. But what we want is um, the client to utilize their hips as much as possible, or at least you using our hips as much as we use our ankles to squat. So in this case. When 
when I don't have ankle mobility, I'm going to try to move more at a joint where I have more mobility. So in this case, um, our two choices are move more at the ankle or move more at the hip. I don't have ankle mobility, so I'm going to teach the person to sit back um, onto a box and to really use their butt kind of as the primary mover there. All right, I like that a lot better because the hip has a lot more ability to move um, as well as you know, it's good. the person is going to be able to, um, it's easy to teach, you know, they're able to sit back, so the person gets better at it, you know, we can have them squat down to lower boxes or lower steps until they can squat down to parallel in that position. The next area that we want to look at is the hip, all right, and the hip is one of the best position joints to move the body, all right, so we know that our hip um, flex and extends, Welsh rotates, really flexion and extension is the first thing that we want to take off the table as far as movement restrictions go, you know, because we move forward and backwards um, all day, you know, so with this, we have hip flexion and hip extension. What we like to do is start somebody on their back, okay? So let's say they, we have somebody that couldn't touch their toes, um, somebody that has back pain when they're bending over, that kind of thing. When you're getting them on their back here, they can press into the ground, they can tighten their abs, and they can move their leg in the direction of restriction. The whole idea is that we're, we're utilizing tightness of the core where we're pressing our back into the ground and getting motion from the hips, okay? And so we're tightening up in the right places and we're moving in the right places. Um, and that would be kind of the starting place is, you know, you have somebody that can't do a toe touch um, who has trouble and something like an RDL, that kind of thing. And so we, we simply start them in this ground based position, you know, doing a motion that's similar for hip extension. Same thing. OK, so if somebody can't flex in their hip, you know, we start them in a glute bridge position and we just have them bridging up and down. Eventually, we move them to a more weight bearing position where now, you know, we're in sort of this warrior pose position where the person's pulling their heel, their butt, you know, they're they're moving forward and they're leaning in and out of of hip flexion and hip extension you know and again some two mobility go-to's that I like um, for hip flexion you know you simply get the person on their back have them lift their leg up and down okay this is a drill called leg lowering okay and there's a lot of different ways that we can vary this one up um, for hip extension I like the glute bridge okay there are a lot of w different ways that we can vary it you know we can start them um, on two legs we could eventually move to one um, as far as substitutes go you know if somebody can't get down the way you know what in the problem is their hips again box squatting is another good substitute okay with a box you know they're sitting back to their available range of motion um, they're not losing their form you know their back position stays good as we improve their mobility you know then we can lower them down to lower boxes until eventually we can get them to parallel if this is still a problem we can simply start them in a more ground based position as their drill itself so the bridge is a drill that I like for a lot of people because it's easy to teach and easy to wait up the next mobility area we want to look at is hip rotation okay so we know that our hips um, flex and extend they also rotate and so these are a couple drills um, that we can utilize to teach our body to do so okay and so if any when anybody has um, rotationally induced back pain so uh, you know if your back hurts when you rotate okay these would be good drills to do you know as well as anybody that moves you know maybe side to side it hurts you know that kind of thing and so two drills that I like a lot uh, would be a pigeon pose. Uh, you know, you cross one leg in front here, um, one leg goes back. You know, you can kind of, what I like to do is kind of shift side to side. Um, so one side will be externally rotating on the cross leg side of the front. The other side will be internally rotating on the straight leg side of the back. Uh, the Spider-Man is another one. So we start in a push-up position. You know, we get one leg way out to the side. Uh, and once again, you know, uh, as we, we try to get the elbow to the ground, one side uh, moves out, you know, the other side moves in, so we're mobilizing hip rotation both directions. Four, um, as far as exercise substitutions go, um, again, if somebody's having problems with like valgus knees or, you know, something like that, what we'll do is when, when they're squatting down to a box, you know, we'll cue them to push the knees out. You know, the other option would be if, you know, the person just doesn't get it, if they still have pain with the movement or whatever, you want to sub um, an opposite exercise. And, uh, an ex a, a good sub that I like a lot, it's pretty safe regardless of what we're dealing with, would be a bridge. Um, clients just on their back, they bridge up and down. Again, um, really good entry-level exercise, something that we can do for anybody that we're dealing with. Um, easy way to um, increase our um, increase the resistance of this exercise as well. You can have them hold on to a weight on their pelvis and eventually get them back up to a, to a pattern where their feet are on the ground and they're squatting up and down. 
Moving on to our next area, the thoracic spine is sort of the, the first thing that we want to take off the table in the upper body. Okay, the, the thoracic spine has a greater capacity to rotate as well as um, a probably an equal uh, ability to extend as the lumbar spine. It's just we are oftentimes in such a, a kyphotic or a, a rounded shoulders posture that we want to cue a little bit more extension into this area. Okay, so we look at a lot of people who can't get their arms over their head, um, you know, and have problems with this, uh, with any upper body thing, and we want to make sure that this area is optimized in particular. So some thoracic extension drills I like are the wall slide as well as foam roller extensions you know the key here again in the wall slide you see that you know I have my back press into the wall into the wall for support and I'm just moving my arms up and down okay so again I'm extending my thoracic spine there I'm using my core and I'm training my shoulders to mobilize in that position you know over the roller again I'm trying to press my back into the ground to make sure that I'm not arching from anywhere other than my thoracic spine and I'm just trying to extend and flex over the um, the foam roller for rotation, again, I start in a more ground-based position where I'm in quadruped and I'm um, doing reach and rotates. That's part of our warm-up process. And then, you know, I can extrapolate the drill and, and move to standing eventually. And so for this, you know, for thoracic extension, um, I love the wall slide progression. You know, we'll provide videos of all of these as well. Um, for thoracic rotation, I love the quadruped reach and rotate. Okay, and these, uh, again, these are going to be in our warm-up. So two substitutes that we like. Generally with subs, um, we're going to look first at uh, the... We we'll look first at pressing. Um, very rarely do we find problems with pulling exercises, but anytime you're talking about um, people that have trouble with shoulder mobility, reaching overhead, the first thing that we want to do is just move more in a horizontal direction. Okay, so when I'm moving horizontally here, you see her arms are moving just straight on. It doesn't require as much mobility uh, to produce force. Okay, or it, you know that we might potentially lack, and so uh, the horizontal plane where I'm just moving my arms sort of in line with my chest, much safer for pressing and pulling movements all right uh, modification for dumbbell presses the other thing is you know we can reduce range of motion so one um, way that we like to teach dumbbell presses to begin with is the floor press all right I'm starting with my back on the ground there it limits my shoulder range of motion so I don't max that out um, another substitute that you could utilize uh, would be a band press okay and so again with the, with a band press this is a more open chain movement meaning I'm not uh, having to grip things as hard um, I'm standing up you know, it's a little bit less invasive even than the dumbbell press. There's more, um, my back is not on the ground, so there's more um, room for my scapulae and my back muscles to move around. Um, and this would kind of be the order that I would go. You know, if somebody's having trouble pressing overhead or their shoulder mobility score is not good, start them with horizontal pressing exercises and maybe sub horizontal for vertical pressing or pulling. And then if that's still a problem, if any kind of pressing motions are a problem, uh, limit range of motion. Finally, sub-pulling exercises for pushing exercises. You know, we, we live in a society today that um, moves forward more than it moves backwards or retracts things. And so um, we want to have at least as many pulls as pushes in our program. And then if pushing is aggravating some kind of a shoulder problem or whatever, sub the pushing exercise for pulling exercise. So rowing, um, chin-ups, things like that. And so our first stability area is the knee. Okay, and we talked about optimizing mobility in the joints around the knee. Okay, and that's going to take pressure off of the knee. But the other thing that we want to do is optimize stability in the muscles around the knee. Okay, because joints are dumb. All right, joints don't move anything. Um, muscles influence the position of joints, and oftentimes overactive hip internal rotator muscles are going to cause our knees to come into so sort of this valgus collapse. Um, where they internally rotate or they externally rotate excessively, you know, if we're dealing with the opposite situation. So for us, exercises where, you know, let's say we have somebody whose knees are collapsing in as they're squatting down. One thing that we like to do is we'll put a band around their knees and we'll do what are called um, RNT, which is called, uh, which is reactive neuromuscular training, all right? This is actually feeding the mistake and telling the person to turn on their lazy stabilizer muscles. And so the cueing there uh, would simply be, you know, don't let me push you in, all right? So the person, so the person becomes aware of the problem, you know, and then they start to do things about it. Their body starts to be like, okay, so maybe I need to push out and turn on these muscles to counteract this instead. Okay, another one we like are uh, mini band walks where uh, we're doing the same thing. You know, I, the person has their hands in their butt there, you know, and they're walking. That's a common exercise that, that you'll see uh, put into programs. Anti-extension. 
uh, would be this is the person whose kneecap comes way over their toe. Okay, so what I like to do is, um, you know, if I have somebody that squats and their knees come way over their toe, what I'll do is I'll have them sit back onto a box as I, you, you've seen in uh, pictures before, you know, in pictures in previous slides. Um, that helps them to use their hips more, the knees stay more over their toes that way, and that way the knee joint isn't, um, it isn't experiencing as much shearing force or just pressure in that area. You know, another thing for dealing with single leg is with a split squat, I'll just have somebody put their knee right next to a wall. And so I'll tell them, all right, um, I want you to keep your knee behind this wall as you're doing their split squat. So they know as they're coming up and down, all right, uh, I want to keep my knee behind my toe here. It's either pass or fail. And a lot of people with this stuff, like, they're only going to have to be cued into it. Oftentimes, they've just never known to squat that way, so then or or split squat or whatever it may be. So they don't. But if we, you know, if we cue them into the right position, you know, oftentimes um, that's going to be a pretty quick fix. So some ideas with um, movement uh, solutions here. We talk about RNT. Um, RNT would be, uh, you know, a band around the knees for squatting. Um, the, the band is pulling them in, okay, so we're, we're teaching the client to push out against the bands. Another one for, say, a split squat is, again, the band is pulling their knee into valgus, and so I coach the client to push their knee out away from this, all right? If we're dealing with somebody who has a problem with um, keeping their knees over their toes or they're coming too far over their toes, teach them to sit back onto a box or get their knee um, against the wall with a split squat and tell them, teach them to get, keep their knee behind the wall. Okay, so the lumbar spine. Okay, why do we do core training? All right, core training, the purpose of core training is to resist excess motion in particular directions. All right, so when I'm doing a plank, um, that's an anti-extension exercise. And so I'm trying to teach my body to not extend into the ground. All right, so I want to maintain a flat back position. All right, you know, and, and with this, um, you know, you can see with my arms or my head, you know, with standing core training, it's the same thing. Um, with my arms or my head, my body has to work harder to keep my back flat as opposed to arching. So, you know, when we're training core, we want to start with ground-based progressions like planks and dead bugs. Eventually, we want to incorporate this into standing positions. Anti-rotation is another one where, again, a bird dog position here, I'm trying to move from my arms and my legs versus rotating from my torso. So if we look at our different drills, um, you know, the, we have our, uh, our anti-extension, which um, two drills that I like for that would be plank and dead bug. You know, we'll, we'll include some progressions and some videos of those. Anti-rotation, you know, if things like an anti-rotation press here where he's pressing out with his hands, the band is trying to rotate him uh, towards the band, so his body is having to resist rotation. And a chop across the body where now as he chops, again, his body is resisting the urge to rotate from his torso. With anti-lateral flexion, you know, a side plank would be the ground-based uh, equivalent of this. You know, we, we learned to do this pretty well, you know, and then eventually... Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm trying to hold in this position uh, without uh, side bending into the ground. A farmer carry or one arm farmer carry would be the standing equivalent of this. So I'm walking, I'm carrying a, uh, you know, heavy implement. I'm trying to not side bend to the other down. I'm not trying not to side bend down to one side. So I'm using my abs to stay upright. Okay, with anti-flexion, you know, we're looking at something like a glute bridge where we're trying to extend from our hips um, without overextending. Okay, so I'm, I'm trying to resist flexion um, while, you know, maintaining uh, the proper spinal position. Okay, and again, with that, uh, you know, a, a good example of that with... You know, a standing drill would be just simply teaching a deadlift. You know, you have somebody that um, is deadlifting. You can see in proper form here is he flexes his spine. Okay, we want to teach somebody to move, you know, with a neutral spine to be able to keep his back flat and stand up and simply stand without overextending his trunk. Okay, so really any drill in standing position is a core training drill. You just have to cue them to use their core. Okay, so think about how you can build awareness around our ground-based exercises um, in order to get them into the best position possible. And really the final area that we're going to look at is the scapula in the neck. And really um, the scapula upwardly rotates, downwardly rotates, it protracts, retracts, um, it depresses, and it elevates. But for us, um, we're going to try to simplify this into a couple big bang drills for us. And so two things that are, that are particularly important are cervical stability. Okay, oftentimes we're going to get a the dominance of our um, 
the back of our neck muscles, our neck extensor muscles that bring our neck forward. You know, we see this in forward head posture um, versus our cervical flexors that push our neck back. Okay? And so um, doing chin tucks on the ground, you know, and then pressing your neck into the ground and training rotation properly is a great thing to do because it teaches these muscles to hold your head in place and really everything is the slave to the cervical spine so this sort of thing is an integral um, part of just retraining or maintaining stability of the upper body the other thing would be a forward facing wall slide all right i love this drill because it involves um i can get my elbows and my arms against the wall and as the coach I put a, or I cue the client to put a little bit of pressure in the wall with their palms. I can stand behind them and kind of cue their arms, their shoulder blades up and down to kind of show them what it should feel like with proper motion. So we're training sort of the timing of their arm move or their shoulder movement up and down, you know, and sort of cueing the right muscles to turn on at the right time. And so the final step, you know, after we utilize these isolated mobility drills is to reintegrate them into global movement. All right. So we, we do our sort of ground based activation exercises um, and our foam rolling. And we finish with things like squat stand, Spider-Man, overhead split squat, things like that. You know, large dynamic movements and incorporate everything together. OK. And so if you train, if you're you have a particular area that is, you know, that you're looking to improve, like a uh, hip rotation or something like that, you want to start with a ground based exercise like a, you want to roll the particular area. Area. So roll the muscles around that area, like the hip rotators or whatever is restricting that area. Start with a ground-based mobility exercise like a uh, Spider-Man or a um, sideline clam that addresses that particular motion. And then put it back into a large global pattern like a squat, like an inchworm, like a Spider-Man. And really, you know, to, to uncomplicate this, all of this is done in our warm-up. Okay, so just look at the way our warm-ups are set up. We roll, uh, we do ground-based stuff, and then we do standing stuff to kind of see how this process works. And so when you talk about mobility, again, um, I don't expect you to know a ton of drills. Um, my biggest thing is know a few that work for you. You can see that um, my library here is very small. I only change these drills when something better comes along, and that's very rare. I like these drills because they're things that I can teach. They're things that I can show the client uh, to get bang for their buck. And, you know, again, we want to just keep it as simple as we possibly can. My stability library, same thing. Simple drills, one to two things, things that I can modify. So if we look at the process in total, we foam roll, we do activation, and then we do our standing mobility drills. All right, so foam rolling is we release the areas that we're either working on for corrective exercise or that we're going to do in that particular workout. Okay, then we use ground-based activation drills, again, to get the right areas of the body turned on that we want to work. And then finally, um, we're going to practice our, you know, we're going to do a little bit of practice on the movements that we're going to train. Or um, we're going to practice, uh, you know, utilizing the segments we just worked on uh, for corrective exercise. So an example for total body workout, I know that I'm going to be working the whole body. So therefore, I roll the whole body. Um, I do mobility drills for both the upper and the lower body for activation. I'm sorry, activation drills. And then I do some uh, global movement patterns that involve uh, the movements that I'm going to be um, working on. I teach the person to move in multiple directions, squatting, put hands on the ground, that kind of thing. Whereas the upper body, I'm putting more focus on rolling a lot, uh, many more areas of the upper body. I'm mobilizing those areas um, and I'm, I'm doing activation drills for those areas. You know, same thing for the lower body. So really with that, it's kind of just common sense. Prioritize the areas that you're either in trying to improve with corrective exercise or uh, that you're going to be working on that day.